Hello, good evening, and welcome to My Heavy Offenses. It's great to be back with one of our topics, one more topics to be exact, and I'm glad to be back with Dr. Angela Ionesa. Hello, hi, how are you? Hope you are, had a great day and are ready to educate us a bit today as well. Thank you, nice to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining us once again. And as you already know, we will talk about hydrosalpings. And Dr. Yanis is here to simply explain what it is, how is it diagnosed, and of course, all those details. So uh, she has her presentation on that topic. But afterwards, there will be time for your questions. So as always, if you have any questions, you know what to do. Just put those in the chat section and we'll be happy to, to help you out with those. And remember, it's being recorded. It's all anonymous. So don't hesitate. This is time. This time is is definitely uh, dedicated to you. So if there are any questions you might have, don't uh, don't hesitate and just type those questions. Uh, and of course, before we start, as always, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. And again, if you are or you know someone who would like to help us out and to volunteer, we are still looking for some volunteers. You can find my email in the chat. So I encourage anyone who might be interested and I'd be happy to give you some more details on that. And now I think it's best to go ahead with our presentation. I'm really looking forward to, to talk, to discuss this because we haven't discussed this topic in particular, this one. So I'm glad that we will talk about this today. And uh, Dr. Anissa, are you ready to start? Let's take it. Thank you so much then. Let's go ahead. Here's the presentation and let's begin. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a bit. Okay, so welcome all. It's a pleasure being here. Today we are discussing a very interesting topic uh, that will be what is hydrosopics and how can it affect my creativity. Let's see what we are going to cover today. This is how we will uh, address the, the subject. Uh, first, we're going to define what is hydrosalping. Secondly, we're going to discuss how it might affect fertility. In third place, we're going to discuss how to diagnose it, okay? And in the last place, we're going to look into possible solutions to uh, improve our patient's fertility options. So as the name says, hydrosalping is an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the fallopian tubes. Uh, um, it could be liquid, just liquid, but it could, it could also be uh, blood. And in that case, we would, talk, we would be talking about hematosalpings. Uh, normally, the presence of that liquid inside the, the, the cavity of the, of the tube is going to make them blocked. Um, and since there's an accumulation of fluid, they might become dilated, okay? So we might be able to see that on an Im image um, test. It could be unilateral or it can be bilateral, affecting both tubes. Normally it is unilateral, but there are some conditions in which we might, we might see both tubes affected. And uh, the main cause of um, hydrosalpings is uh, infection. Obviously, in the developed world, this is not uh, something very common. It is more common in, in developing countries. But past uh, um, chlamydia infection, it being the main, the main, the main cause of um, inflammatory pelvic disease, uh, could be a cause for hydrosalpings. Okay? Not in all of the cases that is going to begin, the, the, the hydrosalpings is going to begin with a clearly dilated accumulation of, of liquid. In, some, in most of the cases, I would say, uh, the tube first becomes blocked. That is going to impair the normal um, homeostasis of the fluid between between the cells and eventually okay that is going to uh, become more dilated and we'll be able to see fluid in, in the infections in some <laughs> uh, severe uh, pelvic inflammatory conditions we might also see what we call pyosalpings which is a clearly accumulation of um, infectious substances inside inside the tubes Obviously, um, that is going to um, affect fertility in many ways that we, we are going to cover later. And fertility can be itself a symptom of the disease, okay? But the patients come to the consultation, uh, 
because there's a delay in the, the motherhood or the, preg the pregnancy does not come and we do some specific exams and we find out about the, uh, the blockage and the accumulation of the, of the liquid. Some other symptoms less frequent, I would say, can be chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia, some menstrual disorders, normally um, spotting, that is also associated with especially hematosalpings, and as we, I was saying earlier, difficulties in achieving a pregnancy. Obviously, if there's some kind of blockage of or liquid inside the tubes, that is going to affect fertility because the tube is the normal place in which the spermatozoa is going to meet the ovulated egg. So if there's a blockade or if there's a, a clear obstruction to the spermatozoa ascension, the fertilization will not take place. How can we diagnose hydrosalpings? Well, um, there are two ways nowadays, okay? The first one is stereosalpingography, uh, which is a, an X-ray technique in which we're going to introduce some contrast medium through the cervix inside the uterus. And normally that contrast medium should be able to clearly fill in the tubes, dilating them and just fall inside the abdominal cavity. If we see a uh, blockade to the contrast the, con the contrast medium we're going to talk about a blockade in the affected tube okay and if there's a blockade and accumulation of the liquid the uh, contrast medium is going to fill in that cavity as well and we will be able to see it on the x-ray image okay this technique is the uh, most uh, spread one it is still widespread nowadays okay um but it is an invasive technique, it requires the, the utilization of um, contrast medium and it is a bit painful, okay? So thankfully, uh, obviously the, the technology has advanced and nowadays we can do an stereosonosapingography, okay? Which is a technique that will also allow us to study the, the permeability of the tubes, but uh, it is easier. It is easier because we can do it in office, in the consultation. Obviously, in both cases, we, we normally use um, prophylactic antibiotics before doing the, the exam. And the, the main advantage of the stereosonosapingography, other than being the gynecologist itself uh, performing the, the procedure, is that we can use non-contrast and non, non um, how we say, we can use a contrast medium, which is actually just almost like water, okay? So that is going to make things easier. The most used one is that the one that you're seeing the, there, the, the XM foam. And we feel quite comfortable doing this in office uh, because it is less painful for the patients. We have a higher control of the, pro the process, okay? Because with the small quantities, we can see everything. And then by doing also the, the ultrasound scan, especially if we're doing a 3D scan, it's going to give us um, a great view of the uterine cavity as well. And in some cases, we are able to, in the same procedure, diagnose um, some other kind of conditions inside, inside of the uterine cavity. We can and normally in Tambre, this is the procedure we are doing nowadays, stereosonosapingography, okay. And those last ones, okay, laparoscopy is, let's say, the, the gold standard, in, uh, so to speak, because obviously if we have a direct view of, the, of the, the tubes, we can see a clear dilation and accumulation of liquid, but obviously uh, making a patient uh, undergo, undergo a surgery uh, for diagnostic purposes is not the, the, the ideal way of doing things. So only in very um, not certain conditions or situations, we'll be asking our patients to do a laparoscopy or sometimes we do directly a diagnostic uh, and um, therapeutic laparoscopy, okay, meaning that we're going to confirm that there's an either salpings in the, pro, in, the pro, in the procedure. And also, if we do confirm that there's a, a hydro salpings, we're going to remove it in the same procedure, okay. Transvaginal ultrasound by itself, um, if there isn't a clear uh, hydro salpings, we won't, wouldn't be a diagnostic, a diagnostic procedure, okay. But it is true that if the transvaginal ultrasound is done by um, experts in ultrasound and if they take the time, they have um, 
good uh, equipment to do the procedure and uh, the hydrosalpins is clearly visible, okay, we can diagnose it in the, in the, in the transvaginal ultrasound, okay. But sometimes it, it is not so, so clear, the, the diagnostic, okay, but if, the, if we have a clear hematosalpin or a clear hydrosalpin, we're going to see it in transvaginal ultrasound scan, okay, and we do need to take, we do need to, to take the time to, to try to diagnose it, okay. So actually, this is something very interesting because initially uh, IVF was <laughs> developed to treat the, the tubal factor, meaning uh, troubles in the, in the fallopian tubes. Obviously, as I was uh, introducing at the beginning, nowadays the tubal factor is not the main um, indication for an IVF treatment, but initially IVF was, was specifically created for that, meaning that if the egg and the spermatozoa were not able to meet at the, the original place, the, the fallopian tubes, that um, encounter between the egg and the spermatozoa would take place outside in the lab. The fertilization would be done in a lab. The embryos would, be, would start growing in the lab. And once they were ready, they would be transferred. Okay? Initially, they were, they were ready uh, as soon as now, but they, we weren't able to keep them in the lab. So we were transferring a lot of embryos uh, very early, in, in very early stages inside the uterus. Nowadays, thankfully, we can perform that embryo development in the lab and, and, and we have improved the, the embryo selection process, okay? But normally, the main treatment for hydrosalpins would be IVF, okay? The thing is that if there's a clear accumulation of liquid inside the, inside the tubes, that liquid might come inside the uterine cavity, okay? That's a hypothesis that, that normally we, um, we use to, think, to try to explain how the accumulation of liquid is going to impair the, the fertility. And uh, that liquid uh, flowing inside the uterine cavity might impair the endometrial receptivity. And obviously, we, we also talk about the physical factor of the liquid washing out the embryo, okay? So if there is hydrosalpings, uh, normally the, all of the, the clinical guidelines and the research tell us that is going to affect and worsen the prognosis of our patients. And the uh, suggestion is to get that hydrosalpings removed before transferring the embryo, okay? Um, right now, there's a lot of discussion about whether we should we should be removing the, the, the hydrosalpins, performing the salpingectomy uh, before the ovarian stimulation or after. That's an ongoing discussion. But what is clear is that if we do see a clear, a clear accumulation of liquid inside the tubes, it is advised to remove that liquid before going ahead with the embryo transfer because we know that liquid might um, hinder the uh, pregnancy options, okay? And well, that was it, okay? Uh, I think we've covered everything. And now let's get to the most uh, interesting part, which is discussion. And I'm open for all of your questions. Thank you so much for in, for for introducing this this topic today as well. And of course, as you uh, you are right, it's time for your questions. There's one question ready. But of course, if you have any more, you know what to do. Go ahead, type those in. Dr. Yanessa is here to explain to support you with anything that you might have. And let's have a look uh, at the first question that we received from Kela. So let me just take a look. So how should Sorry. How soon should I seek treatment for hydrosalpings if I'm planning to conceive? And what is the success rate of treatment in terms of improving fertility? Okay, so if you know that you have a hydrosalpings, as, as I've said right now, the, the advice, the medical advice is to get that 
remove to perform normally there are different there are different approaches okay to hydrosalpings um one of them should be trying to remove the liquid but the most advised one is just removing the the, the fallopian tube affected by the hydrosalpines okay that's a, the most advised strategy nowadays so if we do know that there's a hydrosalpines we should treat it before attempting uh before trying to conceive okay it is not 100 percent sure that 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 hydrosalpings is going to prevent you from getting pregnant but since it's it could worsen the prognosis and re decrease the likelihood of achieving a pregnancy it is advised uh, to remove it before uh, trying to conceive and then the success rate of the treatment is related to other factors okay the main prognostic factors we deal with right now is women's age um, and the ovarian reserve markers okay so we should address and your gynecologist should address all those topics together but also separately uh, before um, going ahead with uh, with a treatment if eventually you're going to do so okay thank you so much i hope that helped i do believe so so thank you for your first question more questions are coming in and would like to know are there other reasons for fluid in the uterus um <laughs> there are the reserve fluid in the uterus yes um and... Uh, impairments in the well first one is, is a block a physical blockades of the shedding of the endometrium and the menstrual fluid and the mucus okay such as fibroids uh, specifically speaking fibroids uh, in the middle third of the uterine cavity but in some other situations we get abnormal uh, endometrial functioning that can cause a uh, mucometra accumulation of mucus inside the, the endometrial cavity normally um, or more usually those issues are related to some kind of uh, hormonal imbalance or hormonal play, uh, impairment or um, histopathological anomalies in endometrium okay so it should be discussed and and, and approach uh, individually i would say depending on on the your case and what we see on the ultrasound the scan etc Okay, got it. Again, thank you so much. And next question from Doris. So can hydrosalpings also be caused by endometriosis? Definitely. Um, hydrosalpings can be caused by endometriosis because we know that endometriosis is an inflammatory disease. Uh, you already know, and here in my IV answers, you've talked a lot about endometriosis, so you know a lot about it. But um, normally, the main affectation of endometriosis is not those large cysts that we see in the ovaries, which it by themselves could also co cause um, hydrosalpings, but it's just diffuse, spread small microscopic lesions inside the abdominal wall. So those, is those lesions are also subjected to the normal shedding of the, of the endometriosis. The shedding of the bleeding, the, the menstrual period, um, obeys to a, an inflammatory procedure, and that inflammatory procedure occurring elsewhere, in this case in the abdominal cavity, can lead to additions. Okay, so we have those additions happening or involving the, the tube. The tube might become blocked, okay, because it's going to be stuck to another stru structure, and uh, from that blockade, we can eventually uh, see or uh, eventually uh, hydrosalpings could uh, develop. Also, another, another type of affection, which is also uh, related to endometriosis, is hematosalpings. You know, one of the explanations for endometriosis is the retrograde uh, flow of the menstrual, the menstrual bleeding instead of going outside some of the flow is going inside, okay, it's going inside from the endometrium up to the tubes and inside the abdominal cavity, okay? So um, that endometrium, the, those endometriotic implants inside the tube could eventually lead to an accumulation of blood, which could become a clear hematosalpics, okay? Okay, I, I will switch to the next question, okay? And I will go back to the previous one. So also, is there a direct relationship between hydrosalpings by infectious cause and chronic endometritis? Could be, uh, physiologically and pathologically speaking, could be. But the thing with chronic endometritis, um, um, if we have uh, hydrosalpings or biosalpings related to uh, pelvic inflammatory disorder, PID disorder, um, in those cases, we, could, we can eventually end up seeing also an acute 
endometritis, okay, which is clearly uh, which obeys to an acute infection and an ongoing infection. The thing with chronic endometritis is uh, that normally it is not related to an acute uh, infection, okay, it's more related to some kind of imbalance inside or on the the base uh, baseline layer of the endometrium and we do not really know the cause we don't know whether it's something related to the normal shedding of the endometrium we cannot say whether it's related to a normal balance we cannot we do not know whether it's related to to um, abnormalities in the microbiome to other causes so physiologically speaking, I mean, it is a plausible explanation, okay, but it is not the most, uh, I would say, uh, frequent one, okay. It's not the we are not seeing chronic endometritis together with a PID, a pelvic inflammatory disorder. We would be seeing an acute endometritis, and it is very, very unusual nowadays. Normally, acute endometritis is related to other causes. All right. Again, brilliant. Thank you so much. I will go back to our previous patient. And so she had some more details here. So thanks. I had fluid in the uterus while preparing for natural cycle frozen embryo transfer, transfer, sorry, but it cleared on time. The doctor suggesting to remove the tubes before next transfer, even though there was no hydrosulfing seen on any scan or during laparoscopy. Anything you can advise here? Yeah, it, it is a, it is a, I would say a, a frequent approach. Uh, frankly, um, if all of the possible causes uh, laying in the midstream have been discarded, we can do it. I mean, I've never, I've never had to do it in my life because it's been more related to the endometrium. But uh, it's something we can do at the end of the day. Once we are inside the, the IVF path, um, the tubes do not, will not play a role. But by removing those tubes, we need to accept in some situations that has already been accepted that we're going to remove the, the chances of having a, 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 an unassisted pregnancy, I would say. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's, a, it's an old school approach, I would say. All right. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, we will go now to the previous questions that we missed here. So can open myomectomy cause hydrosalpings? Um, can open myomectomy, so that means through lap laparotomy. Um, well, <laughs> we were discussing that one cause for hydrosalpings could be additions, okay, uh, meaning that the tubes would become stuck to um, nearby structures. So I would say yes, but frankly, on a program myomectomy, um, now it is very, it would be very unusual. And in most of the surgeries nowadays, there are some kind of uh, prophylactic treatment specifically to prevent additions. So most likely, I would say no. Clear. Thank you so much again. And so should patients with hydrosulfings be treated broadly with antibiotics since most cases are infectious? So that's a, a treatment uh, I've read about uh, performing um, long rounds of antibiotic treatment, but the standard treatment nowadays is uh, the surgery. Most cases are infectious. Well, um, they could be related to infection initially, but uh, they do not need to. So doing, going ahead with a prophylactic antibiotic treatment, I would say that if we have a high interest in preserving the tubes, it could be an acceptable approach. It is something that is described in the literature, but the standard, the gold standard treatment is surgery, either to aspirate the fluid and try to make the, the, the tubes um, open again or directly removing the tubes. Okay, again, thank you. And now if you can clarify this, perhaps, so what do you mean? Can the embryo leave the uterine cavity after transfer through the fistula after removal of the fallopian, fallopian tubes? Well, actually, shouldn't, there shouldn't be any, any fistula. I haven't, I haven't seen anything as like, so maybe she can, she can reformulate the, the question. Mm -hmm. Because you I can... don't know what... Yeah. Just specify exactly what you mean, okay? So we can, we will definitely go back to this question, okay? So it is crystal clear for uh, Dr. Yanisa here as well. 
Okay, and now we will have some more details. So let's have a look. Uh, so I had laparoscopy, two fibers removed five years ago, since had eight IVF transfer, fresh and frozen, only two positive pregnancies, which one, one ended in missed miscarriage at seven weeks. The most recent was chemical. Do you recommend having another laparoscopy to check no fibers returns, etc.? I feel I've hit, hit a brick wall. Yeah, obviously um, it is worth looking into the situation. Um, diagnostic laparoscopy is no longer uh, advised, uh, not even for endometriosis according to the latest guidelines. So frankly, my advice, there are many things that should be uh, taken into account in these kind of situations. But when it, when it comes to the diagnostic uh, method, I would say that nowadays a well-done 3D ultrasound is almost as good as any laparoscopy to first study obviously the fibroids and also rule out um, hydrosalpings. All right, thank you indeed once again. And let me just take a look, possibly our final question. So if you have more, go ahead, type those in. And if you wish to just clarify for us uh, the previous question, just go ahead, do it as well. And let's see, Michaela would like to uh, know, so does having hydrosalpings increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy? And if so, how can this be, how can this risk be minimized? So that's correct. Hydrosalpings or problems in the, in the fallopian tube spermability, that is going to increase the risk of an ectopic pregnancy. And even though that might seem paradoxical, Intrauterine transfer of an embryo, meaning leaving the embryo in the right place, is a risk factor for an ectopic pregnancy. We don't really know the causes. Maybe it's just the the, the pushing of the well technique to leave the embryo transfer the embryo inside of the uterine cavity during the embryo transfer. Um, the only way to minimize, minimize that risk, which uh, I always discuss with with our patients in the consultations, is by removing the tubes, and it's uh, it's something that is difficult, it's something that is not clearly um, stated or for which there isn't a um, unanimous vision. But in my experience, I've had many cases in which we've tried to manage um, conservatively the tubes. We've done an embryo transfer. We had discussed the for ectopic pregnancy and unfortunately we've had that ectopic pregnancy. So we are really leaving the embryo in the right place. The only way to decrease that risk, if we know that there's an impairment being just a blockade or, or a blockage or um, liquid in the tubes to decrease the, the odds of having an ectopic pregnancy is by removing the tubes because obviously there are other places where the pregnancy could mistakenly implant. Okay, there are other places of ectopic pregnancy, but the likelihood is a lot, uh, a lot lower. So unfortunately, removing tubes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And one more uh, question is here. So after surgery to remove hydrosalpings, is there still a chance to get pregnant naturally? Well, um, I've seen everything. I've seen everything. Uh, now I've even seen abdominal pregnancy. So um, we can never say never, but I say, I say the odds would be less than 1%. Okay. Which is how we say impossible, but uh, well, yeah. you never know. Of course. Well, I understand. Of course. Thank you so much for clarification here. And let me have a look. If there's there are more questions, go ahead, type those in. But I think it was still already an interesting session with lots and lots of questions uh, that you already answered. Uh, so let's give it a minute. Let's give it a minute. If we will not have more questions, we will be finishing for today. Um, but I think it's all... Yeah, it's right here, one more, let's see. So what are the risks during the removal sur surgery? No, I would say it's a very easy and straightforward surgery if we are only dealing with the hydrosal things, okay? Uh, it could be more um, complicated, for example, if we have a deep, severe infiltrating endometriosis, if we have uh, a mass involving the, the tubes and, and nearby structures, but if we're talking about just an isolated hydrosal things, even if it's bilateral affecting both sides, it is a pretty easy surgery. It's the first, almost one of the first surgeries um, Chinese gynecologists uh, learn how to do. So you can 
be reassured about that. So you don't need to worry too much about that. No. <laughs> Brilliant. That's that sounds good then, of course. Thank you so much. And I believe that was our final question. But of course, remember, if you have more, we will be back. But also, you can always get in touch with Dr. Inessa and her team at Chile Clinica Tambra. And I'm sure she'll be happy to, um, to help you out uh, as well. So someone is typing. Let's give it a second. Yeah, it's a, it's a thank you. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And I believe you found it useful, I'm sure. Uh, so thank you uh, for joining us. And before we finish, is there anything else you wish to wish you wish to add, Lutianessa? No, thank you so much. As always, thank you for your participation because it's the, the thing I love the most about these, these encounters. And yes, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate, get in touch uh, with us at Tambre and we'll be more than happy to try to help you with your case. Definitely. Thank you so much indeed. And again, someone is typing. Let's give it a second to see. Yes, it's another thank you. So brilliant. Thanks so much for your uh, thank yous. And I also wanted to add that we will be back. Of course, we will be back. Actually, this Thursday, we will talk about PCOS. If this is something you are thinking of, I mean, if you if this is something that is interesting for you and you are looking for some information, PCOS, Join us. We will be back with Dr. Victoria Mohni. So I hope you will be able to join us at 7 p.m. UK time. And of course, we will be back with Dr. Yanessa, I'm sure, pretty soon. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone. And have a lovely evening and take care. See you soon. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.